Hello and I hope you're having a great day. I've had a number of comments on the previous video with regards to the rapture and how the rapture relates to salvation. It would seem that many people believe that there will be no saved person who will be left behind after the rapture. I would like to address this and compare this understanding with what is written in the Bible and how the rapture fits in with the harvest and temple models. I actually had a much longer script for this video but decided to shorten it as much of the information had already been covered in other videos. I have linked the longer script in the description below for those who would like to read through more of the detail. Now I do not claim to know everything and what I offer you is the understanding that I derive by focusing on avoiding contradiction between what I understand and what is said in the Word of God, in as many instances as I can find information for about a subject. Many would seem to believe that the rapture concludes the process of salvation, or that there would be no people left on the earth who believe that Jesus is the Son of God after the rapture occurs. Many also claim that if a split occurs between believers at the rapture, that our salvation is no longer by grace, but that it requires works or that such an understanding supports a lordship salvation, which is certainly not what I stand for or would ever promote. Today I would like to point something out between what Jesus said about those that were given to him, and how what he said relates to the first resurrection, or the harvest of those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God. I discuss the application of the harvest and temple models in quite a bit of detail in these videos, and you are welcome to watch them for the details that I will not be covering in this video today. As always, I aim to obtain an understanding that lines up with as much of God's word as possible, not only in the text that we read, but also the models and patterns that our Heavenly Father has provided us in His word. So when I consider the first resurrection, I not only look at what is written in Revelation 20, I would also like to know why John calls the resurrection of the dead in Revelation 20 the first resurrection, and why Jesus' resurrection was not the first. When we ask this question, we find an answer from Paul telling us that Jesus' resurrection represented the first fruits of a harvest, and as such we need to understand the harvest model well in order to understand what is said in relation to the resurrection of the dead. One passage that I would like to focus on today, that some offer as substantiation against a partial rapture, is the following. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. From this passage it would seem that once a believer is saved, that being lost after this point is no longer possible. I believe this is certainly the message that Jesus is conveying to those who are saved and who belong to him and to those who are known by him. But we have to bring the harvest model into account when we consider his words. One question we have to ask when we think about the harvest of believers or the first resurrection is what does the word of God tell us about the ownership of the three portions that make up a harvest? Do all three sections of a harvest belong to the owner? Would it align with scripture if we said that the entire harvest belongs to the owner of the field? This is what the word of God has to say about this. Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, When ye be come into the land which I give unto you, and shall reap the harvest thereof, then ye shall bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest, and he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath the priest shall wave it. And when ye reap the harvest of your land, thou shalt not make clean riddance of the corners of thy field when thou reapest, neither shalt thou gather any gleaning of thy harvest. Thou shalt leave them unto the poor and to the stranger. I am the Lord your God. So based on what is written in the word of God, a harvest consists of three portions, namely, the first fruits, which belong to the Lord, the main harvest, which belongs to the owner of the field, and the corners, which belong to the poor. So when we understand the ownership of the portions of a harvest, who are those that are given to Jesus, of which he lost none? 
If our aim is not to contradict the word of God, only those who are part of the main harvest that the owner is allowed to reap belong to the owner, or are given to the owner according to God's word. This specifically excludes the corners of the harvest as they are technically someone else's possession. The Bible clearly tells us that the corners of the harvest are to be given to the poor, and that this portion of the harvest does not belong to the owner. It is important to note that the harvesting process does not determine the properties of the harvest itself. If we consider a barley harvest, for instance, the entire field will consist of barley that will be harvested over time in three separate sections. The first fruits, the main harvest and the corners all consist of barley only. The same is true for the first resurrection where we have people who believe that Jesus is the Son of God who make up the three sections of this harvest. It is however somewhat frightening to think that those who are positioned as the corners of the field does not technically belong to Jesus as he has to give them over to the poor which represents Satan and his fallen angels who will be confined to the world during the tribulation. It is also very frightening to think that Jesus' words in John 17 verse 12 do not cover those who are part of the corners of the field as they are not given to him according to the harvest model provided to us in the word of God. This is further confirmed for us in the temple model where we see the outer court matching the corners of the harvest that are left to the poor being given to the Gentiles and not to the Lord. But the court which is without the temple leave out, and measure it not, for it is given unto the Gentiles, and the holy city shall they tread underfoot forty and two months. However, since the entire harvest is sanctified by the first fruits, the corners are holy and devoted to God, according to Romans 11. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy, and if the root be holy, so are the branches. However, in order for the corners of the harvest to remain holy and devoted to God, they will have to apply Leviticus 27's instructions in order to do so. Notwithstanding, no devoted thing that a man shall devote unto the Lord of all that he hath, both of man and beast, and of the field of his possession, shall be sold or redeemed. Every devoted thing is most holy unto the Lord. None devoted which shall be devoted of men shall be redeemed, but shall surely be put to death. Those who are part of the corners of God's harvest of faith, or believers in Jesus Christ who find themselves in the tribulation, whether they have been saved before the rapture occurred, or only came to salvation after the rapture, will have to die in Christ, as people without the mark of the beast in their bodies, or face losing their salvation and becoming the eternal possession of the poor, or Satan. We see this confirmed in the book of Revelation, where those who die in Christ, without the mark of the beast in their bodies, are called blessed. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. What about those who believe that Jesus is the Son of God, who accepts the mark of the beast in their bodies? And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up for ever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Do you see how apparent contradictions in Scripture begin to resolve when we apply the models that are provided in the Word to what we read in other sections of God's Word? This is actually a very scary thought, to think that people who believe that Jesus is the Son of God will be given over to Satan for a possession, 
and that some of those in God's harvest actually desire to become Satan's possession by desiring to enter the tribulation, instead of being part of those who belong to the owner of the field and who cannot be pulled from God's hand. If my brothers and sisters in Christ who are awaiting their time in the tribulation only wanted to study the harvest model, they would see this clearly. So what determines our position in God's harvest of faith, and how can we be sure that we are part of the main harvest that will be given to Jesus, and of which he will lose none? And how can we avoid becoming part of the corners of the field that will be given over to Satan as a possession? The difference between the main harvest and the corners are provided to us in the parables of the ten virgins and the good and evil servants. Also, Jesus' evaluation of the seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3 expands on this. All the attributes regarding the differences between those who are known by the Lord and those who are not are provided in these parables, and I have discussed them in some of my previous videos. In short, it comes down to the attitude of your heart once you are saved. Ask yourself, where is my heart's desire? Do you desire the world, what it has to offer, and to spend more time in the world? Or do you desire to be with Jesus and to see what He prepared for you during the past 2000 years? Do you get angry at people who are looking for the Lord's return? Or are you someone who is looking forward to His return, even when you have to suffer the scorn of fellow Christians, even, for doing so? I hope this study has shown you that the rapture does not determine whether a person is saved or not. Neither does it conclude salvation through faith, as there will be many saved people who will be left on earth as part of the corners of God's harvest, which he has to leave to the poor, or to Satan, according to his word. We just have to understand God's models and patterns to understand this truth. Those who become the corners of God's harvest have not trusted completely in Jesus' finished work on the cross, and partially relied on their own works that they offered to God in addition to what Jesus did as reason for their righteousness and for entry into God's kingdom. If you believe that every person who believes that Jesus is the Son of God will be removed from the earth when the rapture occurs, then you believe that God will also reap the corners of his harvest and that he will leave nothing for the poor. Do you think that God will break his own word? and not follow the rules that He provided to us when He is about to reap a harvest? If you have not accepted the Lord Jesus yet, then I urge you to do so right now. There is so little time remaining, and the division between the main harvest and the corners that will be left behind will soon occur. If you have accepted the Lord Jesus as your Savior, and you are relying on some of your own works to augment His gift on the cross to you, or believe that your salvation can only be guaranteed by Jesus' works plus something else, then you have to carefully consider your position, as our Heavenly Father cannot accept an offer of sin mixed with His Son's righteousness as a reason to stand before Him. Our Heavenly Father only accepts perfection, and as such, we have to put 100% of our trust in Jesus' finished work on the cross for our salvation and righteousness. I hope that you will desire to be part of the harvest that belongs to Jesus and not desire to be part of the portion which he has to hand over as a possession to Satan when he reaps his harvest. If you find yourself in the tribulation, remember that if you accept the mark of the beast in your body, you declare that you have transferred your ownership to Satan for eternity and will no longer be eligible for the salvation that Jesus provided to those without the mark of the beast. It will be better to lay your life down willingly and to suffer beheading than to suffer eternal torment with Satan in the lake of fire that God prepared specifically for Satan and his angels. May our Heavenly Father bless you and keep you as you put all your faith and trust in what Jesus did for you on the cross. Until next time, or until we meet in the air, God bless.